welcome everybody to our second episode, uh, Greener Ingredients for Bio-Based Paints and Coatings of the Perfect Food webinar series. My name is Verena Kuhlmann from Nova Institute and together with my colleague Dushitsa, I'm in charge of uh, communication and dissemination of the project. And Perfect Code is, oh, I'm sorry, I had the wrong slide. I will start again. So Perfect Code is a EU research project funded by CBE uh, JU. You learned about it in the first episode of the webinar series. And for those who couldn't attend, there's a video uh, recording to find on the Perfect Code homepage where you can uh, watch it again. Um, here you can see um the upcoming event uh, the upcoming um webinars there are three to follow this is the second part of the um uh, uh the second part and to, to stay up to date please uh, visit our website perfectcodeproject.eu and i want to draw your attention to our stakeholder event in Brussels on April 24th. There are only a few spots left. So for more information, please check the website or follow the QR code. Today, three experts from the Perfect Code Consortium joined us, Amelie Skop, Sjadan Gavilovic, and Anders Odom. Um, and they will give some insights from the project. Before Amelie will start, here are some rules. Please enter your full name and affiliation. And you can do so by clicking on the participant list and on three dots next to your name. If you have questions or comments, please enter these in the Q&A field and address the speaker by using at Emily, for example. And you can also raise your hand if you would like to voice your question verbally. And with this, I will stop my presentation here. And uh, welcome, Emily. You can uh, share Hi. your screen. All right, Hi. let me share my screen then. So here we go. And let's go on presentation note. All right. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Lovely. All right. So I'm Amelie Skop. I'm a researcher at TU in Munich working on the Perfect Code project. And today I want to talk to you about greener ingredients. I titled my talk, The Beauty of Green, Rethinking an Approach to Bio-Based Extenders in Codings. First, I want to recap a little bit what we discussed last time in the last webinar about what are codings, how do they come together, and what do they do? So flatly said, coatings are everywhere. You can find them on different substrates, such as plastic or glass in the automotive or housing sector, as well as on your literal outside of the house, which are mineral substrates on paper or on wood. Additionally, you can also see coatings on more organic substrates like leather or metal. And these are there to fulfill a variety of functions. The top three roles of coatings are on the one hand protection, for instance, from weathering or corrosion. And you can see this here in this picture of this refinery, but you can also think about this protective um, property when you think about painting your garden shed or the outside of your house. When we think of paint, we usually think of the second aspect, which is decoration. So how do we get the color onto your furniture, onto your living room walls, and so on and so forth? And the third property I want to highlight today, or the third role, is the special properties that coatings can give you, such as water repellencies, which are important, for instance, for protecting your house, or the transfer of information as seen here in the traffic sign or road markings at night. Lastly, there's a newer generation of coatings that have special properties such as antimicrobial or anti-fouling properties. And these are used either for instance in hospitals or also in the shipping sector. 
When we look into the main ingredient of paints and coatings, we can basically classify them into five different components. On the one hand, there's the liquid part, which is made of the binder and the solvent. And then interestingly titled, everything that is solid is called the pigment. The pigment encapsulates the what you think about when you think of pigments, which is the color, but these pigments can also give the different functional properties such as anti-fouling or antimicrobial properties. Then there's the filler or extender, which I will focus on today. It's basically a bulk material, usually really cheap to just give the paint volume. It gives it the body, gives it the right rheology. And then there are the additives that are added in very small quantities to just bring everything together and make the formulation work. So if we look into a typical formulation, we can split again into two of the main two different categories. On the one hand, there's a vehicle, which is made of uh, up of the binder and the solvent. And on the other hand, there's the pigment, which is basically the umbrella term for the primary pigment, the additives and the extenders of fillers. So classic examples for these um, components are for binder, for instance, styrene acrylate, which is a naturally drying, uh, nice binder to use. Then a classical solvent that we're trying to work with is water since we wanna make greener, more sustainable uh, paint and coating formulations. The primary pigment that is mainly used is titanium dioxide. It is a bright white pigment and has a high refractive index. So a little bit of it can go a long way. Then the additives are usually used to defoam or emulsify your formulation as well as adjust the pH to the right level. And then the extender or filler is usually cheap bulk material such as talcum or calcium carbonate, uh, carbonate, which is either mined or precipitated. What I want to talk to you today about is that we wanna move into a greener direction for all of these components. And I will focus on fillers or extenders. In this case, we tried to see whether we could use biomass as an alternative to either mined or precipitated fillers, such as calcium carbonate. So just as a recap, the Perfect Code project follows a very modular approach to generating its raw materials and ingredients. It uses either marine residues or lignocellulosic feedstock to generate the precursor molecules. At the same time, we also use biotechnology and microbial produced um, components such as polymers and terpenes to generate all of the formulation components that we need. One thing we wanted to do was to not let anything go to waste. And thus we wanted to use the different micro uh, microbial feedstocks and strains such as prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms to see whether we could use them as a filler. One thing we realized very quickly was that it is not an easy task. Incorporation of just small amounts of microbes as fillers affect the rheology, the color. And you can see this very impressively here on the top where on the very left in the panel, you have a control coating, which is a classic pigment to volume 80 concentration indoor wall paint, which has a high filler content. It's bright white. It is smooth and you can see that incorporation of fillers of microbial origin changes both the rheology and the color. Additionally, depending on the filler that you use, your effect on color can be more drastic or less drastic and your storage is severely affected because bio-based fillers can form perfect growth uh, media for contaminants in air. So we have a molding issue as well. So there are a lot of um, issues that we want to be able to um, tackle here. So there are several performance parameters um, that were tested for these microbial fillers uh, in coatings, such as the color, the gloss, so how shiny the resulting films are, the rheology, or how liquid or solid the formulation is, and the scrub resistance to see how uh, well they hold up. Here, you can just see a variety of different formulations that we generated with the biomass feedstocks from the Perfect Code project. All of these are very um, interestingly colored, ranging from a dark gray to a rosé 
compared to the control coding, which is our control formulation, which is on the top left corner. So we decided that given the swelling issue that affected the spheology so much that we've seen in the last slide and the color, that these were two things we definitely wanted to address. And so we went ahead and modified these fillers so that instead of being dark brown, as seen here on the very right side, they were going to be light and creamy in color. Additionally, we wanted to see that the viscosity, once these uh, fillers get incorporated into the formulations, would not change too much due to their swelling ability. And so we modified them for this aspect as well. And you can see here, after the addition of water to these um, non-functionalized but modified fillers, you do not see as much of an increase in swelling as seen in the control unmodified filler to the very right. We went ahead and incorporated these modified fillers into codings and compared those, which are in the top row, with our control codings on the bottom, the bottom left four ones. And you can clearly see that the color has been altered to a white color and the viscosity or rheology seems to be less affected once we incorporate these second generation bio-based fillers. We tested a lot of other performance parameters, but these will be covered in the next seminar. I want to talk to you now about functionalization of these fillers. And our thought process was, if we already integrate microorganisms into coatings, can we use them as functionalizable platform? And do the functions that we engineer into our microorganisms lend these properties also to the dried coating in the end? So today I want to talk about two case studies we performed. Uh, one of them was my colleague, Madea Marosevic, uh, and I will show her uh, data first. And her goal was to generate a UV sensing coating that would change its color once UV light hit it. To that end, we used uh, microorganisms that were functionalized or non-functionalized as control, put them into our formulations, uh, applied them to standard substrates, and then tested the dried coatings, whether we saw the desired effects or not. One thing that we realized really quickly that was that generating high pigment to volume concentration coatings, uh, so PVCs, um, with high percentages, meaning there's a lot of solids in there, a lot of fillers, is not an easy feat. We wanted to balance, on the one hand, the maximum functionalization payoff, meaning lots of microorganisms in the film, with the ability to still form a proper film. And you can see here on the bottom that the more we increase the percentage of filler or extender, and in this case, biomass, the worse our overall film formation became. To this end, we adjusted the formulations heavily and also tested different microbials, uh, microbial strains as chassis so that we ended up in the end with coding formulations as the two ones on the right that were glossy in appearance, had a high color payoff, and still had proper film formation properties. So now that we had looked into this, we wanted to test whether indeed a color change upon UV irradiation was possible, and we had created a UV sensing formulation. And indeed, you can see here in these two strips, after only an hour of exposure to UV light, the color of the coating turned from green to orange irreversibly, and this prop, uh, property was sustained for several months. We quantified this change in color further and plotted it here in this 2D graph, and you can see that in the UV exposed coating, shown here on the left, there is a move from the green quadrant into the orange quadrant, while we do not see that for the control coating, which was stored in the dark indicating that this color change is indeed due to UV exposure, and we had created a UV sensing coating. The other aspect I want to describe today is using these coatings for catalysis. And we wanted to see whether we could address air pollution with them. To this end, we engineered microorganisms 
um, to be able to remove volatile organic carbons or VOCs from standard room air by just flowing this air over these catalytically active coatings. We then quantified the non-toxic products and compared the amounts of these non-toxic products between the either catalytically functionalized coatings or control coatings. And you can see here on the bottom that indeed we see a significant increase, more than two and a half orders of magnitude of the non-toxic product is generated compared to the control, indicating that indeed we can use these microorganisms as a platform to address air pollution in codecs. We also wanted to check what the effect on catalysis performance was based on the different um, components of our formulations. So the, to this end, we made a regular biocatalytic coating shown here in gray, or a dried biomass film, which did not include the filler, and checked for the catalytic activity. And you can see here on the left, between the light gray bar and the dark gray bar, that there's a significant difference upon binder addition to these coatings. So we realized that actually incorporating these uh, fillers into coatings with a proper formulation hinders catalytic activity initially. However, after a week of storage, we saw a drastic decrease in catalytic activity of the dried biomass film here in light gray, while our coating itself did not lose any catalytic activity, indicating that there's likely a stabilizing effect when the fillers are um, incorporated into a proper coding matrix. We checked for the retention of catalytic activity for several weeks and by now months. And I wanna show you here that after six weeks, we still see a majority of the initial catalytic activity. So these films can work for and be stored for several weeks and still perform their job. So I wanna sum all of this up. Um, and make just a couple of points. So on the one hand, we talked about non-modified biomass as extender alternative. And we've seen that yes, it can work, but there are certain performance parameters that need to be optimized. And more of that will be discussed in the upcoming webinar. At the same time, we saw that microbial cells can be used as functionalization platform. And to this end, we talked about two different case studies where we show that the properties that were engineered into our microorganisms are actually imbued uh, into the final coding. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward to your questions later and stay tuned for more green coding ingredients. Thank you. Thank you, Amelie. And sorry for not introducing you in advance. So I do this now. <laughs> It's um, Emily Scott, she has a degree in biochemistry and cell, bio cell biology and a master degree from the University of Texas. And she did later the PhD on her topic, copper trafficking on the metalloenzyme SOD1. And since 2022, she is a researcher at the Technical University of Munich. Thank you again. And we go on, we go on with Siada. Sjadan has a background in molecular genetics and genetic engineering and later did his PhD on plant microbe interaction during some symbiotic establishment. He joined Teltec in 2021 and is currently working in the field of metabolic engineering where he aims to learn, understand, recreate and design new harmonic bio-based systems. Thank you. And yeah, yes. Hello. Can you hear me all? Yes. Okay. Is the uh, presentation coming through? Fine. Yes. Excellent. Good. Okay. So, uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, working in a uh, biological field in biological sciences, and today I'm going to be presenting more um, biotech uh, aspect of, on this uh, project. I'm going to be presenting joint work from uh, two. Uh, labs, two groups. One is a group at the Imperial College of London, and the other is ours here at Tallinn's University of uh, Technology. Uh, what we work, and why is it not changing? Okay. Um, 
both of these laboratories work with a group of so-called oleaginous uh, yeasts. As you can see, uh, <laughs> just a moment, uh, pointer. Uh, as you uh, do, you see my pointer. Can somebody comment, please? Um, uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes, so pointer. what you can see here is a microscopic uh, image of uh, ol oligonous yeast, where you can see inside of the cell these green uh, lipid uh, droplets. This is specially dyed by uh, dye uh, binding for hi highly hydrophobic structures. Uh, these yeast uh, that we work with, uh, normally they are part of our diets for centuries. For example. Yarovia lipolitica is commonly isolated uh, uh, species from sausages. It's uh, only present in human mouth, uh, different type of uh, food. Uh, Rhodotorula toruloides is um, commonly associated with uh, uh, plant materials. Anybody who's been eating apples and like hard fruits where uh, skin is uh, consumed he has been also been ingesting Rhodotorula in significant amounts. Um, what we uh, use these uh, two species for is uh, to develop so-called second generation materials uh, where we can use different uh, waste uh, materials. Here in Estonia, we, most, we focus uh, largely on the wood uh, waste, uh, but any kind of uh, waste, uh, side stream, uh, byproducts and things like that, uh, more, and more and more we are able to efficiently convert into um, value added the products uh, uh, at this uh, point we literally have technologies available where we can convert any kind of waste uh, old uh, truck tires uh, old shoes or clothing we can use both technological approach to convert into food grade uh, products not only in uh, binders and coating materials but when i'm talking about the industrial uh, raw materials, it's actually an umbrella of different uh, fractions and uh, uh, products uh, extracted from yeast and uh, live uh, cells. Uh, it can be, yeah, so let's not go now in, into this because of the time frame. But for example, one of the things I would like to mention is in aquaculture, uh, where, uh, let's say, in a salmon, where people are consuming salmon for uh, omega-3 fatty acids. However, farm-raised salmons like this, they lack uh, naturally ingested uh, the, uh, ingredients and they're actually very low in omega-3 fatty acids. They don't synthesize either them or pigments uh, to color their flesh and they need to consume them as part of the diet. It's possible to engineer these microbial uh, producers to produce omega fatty acid and to produce uh, pigments. In under industrial conditions, uh, farmers literally take chart of different uh, food that is going to result in a flash of salmon of specific color. Uh, we are now already able to produce a combination of omega fat, omega three fatty acid, and uh, natural biosynthetically produced uh, pigment to compete with uh, com commercially established uh, procedures. How it looks here in our uh, facility, if you look into these uh, samples from left to right, uh, the byproducts that we get from local industry, and actually that is being produced in large quantities by local wood processing industry is being uh, hydrolyzed to produce a so-called wood sugars that is we feed to our organisms, produce biomass as uh, we need. Uh, and uh, depending on the final usage, we can tweak the conditions to change the properties. And then we can isolate different fractions. We can, uh, uh, different fractions and different, different materials uh, and materials of different uh, final uh, properties, specifications are different. We can produce these uh, oils, uh, highly rich in uh, carotenoids or more kind of a battery, highly saturated oils. Uh, there is a spin-off from our work, uh, Io.bio. If anybody interested in these uh, microbially produced oils for human consumption is uh, welcome to have a look at the site. And I would like also kind of uh, to uh, brag uh, a bit. Uh, recently, we installed uh, this 300 uh, 
Lita's bioreactor. I'm not going to discuss too much, but to my understanding, next uh, speaker is going to touch uh, a bit on uh, scale up process in biotech industry. Uh, why do we use these oligenous yeast? Uh, the thing is that uh, they are able to produce this standard uh, uh, fats and oils or whatever if somebody wants to call them, but the same precursor uh, that, uh, that is giving rise to fatty acids also can be diverted into through different set of uh, metabolic intermediates using specific uh, enzymes and produce group of so-called terpenes and terpene derivatives. Either it can be a lemonine as a, a significant component of a citrus peel, uh, humulin as something that the, the classical uh, beer uh, flavor and taste, or beta-carotene as precursor for vitamin A. I'm not going to discuss all of the pathways because I believe that they are beyond, uh, beyond um, this uh, webinar. Um, however, I'm going to mention that terpenes are very diverse umbrella term for multiple different uh, components with uh, significantly different uh, applications and uh, uses. Um, what I already mentioned that uh, green ingredients are not necessarily for us, not necessarily limited to coating and binding uh, uh, materials. Here, I would like to show you heat map of uh, vitamin A deficiency, where the red is uh, uh, presents areas with the uh, most significant vitamin A deficiency, as you can see, in context of territory, but especially in the context of uh, a number of people affected by a vitamin A deficiency, it's a significant problem uh, worldwide. Uh, one of the ways that it was attempted to be addressed uh, by a scientific community is the so-called golden rice. Uh, the population, the most affected by uh, vitamin A deficiency is, is consuming rice as one of the uh, main carbohydrate uh, sources. Uh, scientific groups engineered the, the uh, rice to produce beta-carotene as a precursor. I'm not going to really be going into uh, ethical aspects, how it was implemented and disseminated through the world. Uh, but what I would like to mention is that uh, beta-carotene uh, beta uh, absorption is very related to amount of uh, lipids in the diet. Uh, rice is highly carbohydrate and low lipid uh, food is actually very poor. And most of the beta-carotene ingested is not actually being absorbed. But its bioavailability bio is very uh, limited. However, in a case of these uh, microbes that we work with, uh, with relatively easy uh, change in uh, cultivation condition, we can shift the profile of the carotenoids and amounts, and we can relatively efficiently produce uh, significant quantities of uh, the biomass. What is very uh, advantages of this biomass, at least in comparison with uh, this so-called uh, um, uh, golden rice, is that it's a lipid-rich diet, and bioavailability of uh, beta-carotene, at least for humans, is uh, much higher. In addition, compared to traditionally produced um, lipids and beta-carotene, I would like to point out that uh, soya bean, uh, the uh, so oil from the soybeans, uh, it's uh, just a minor fraction of the seed and calculated on a level of a total aerial part of the plant, it presents only 7.5% of the total biomass. However, in the case of microbial oil, uh, lipids present up to 50, oh, up to 70% of the this harvested the biomass. In a, it's relatively easy to produce them also, I would like to add. On uh, the other aspect, uh, more relevant for the project that we are uh, having the webinar about is the microbial oils. Uh, here it's presented, uh, here I took examples uh, using again soybean oils, uh, but uh, lipids are lipids, uh, the just difference in origin. Uh, how uh, oils are normally being um, functionalized, for example, one of the is to uh, oxidize the double bond in a fatty acid, convert them into epoxide bonds that can be either reacted 
as it is, or they can be further functionalized using uh, acrylate, produced to produce acrylated material. And if that acrylated material is applied on a paper, whatever surface and exposed to UV, uh, there is a cross leaking reaction forming high, mo high molecular weight uh, uh, polymers and uh, very stable structures. On the right, with this uh, figures A, B, C, you can see film formed in a uh, that way. Uh, it's, it can be produced as uh, transparent, it can be produced as matte or or whatever opaque, uh, depending on other component that can be added to tweak its uh, properties. Uh, here is additional a few additional uh, examples. Um, derivat uh, the functionalized uh, uh, oils are already part of the different coating uh, binding uh, materials, paints, epoxy glues, and things like that. They are available as a commercial acrylated epoxidized uh, soybean oils, or there is also significant number of advancements in at least in last few years that are not still function, uh, not still commercialized, but they have very interesting uh, properties. On the left, on the right bottom, uh, there are just some examples of people having a bit of fun, uh, 3D printing uh, different sculptures using uh, epoxidized uh, uh, soybean oil. And here on the top, you can see uh, a potential bio, uh, biomedical uh, application in a case for people suffering from long bones, like the, those that we have in the, uh, our hands and legs, in the case that they are crushed, that there is need either to amputate the people uh, uh, limbs or somehow to find a way how to replace the, the, the uh, long bones. These are 3D printed. Uh, bone replacements uh, and uh, such materials have been shown to be relatively good, uh, showing a relatively good about compatibility. However, what we know already for significant amount of time that quality of uh, uh, material is not necessarily uh, stable enough. Uh, this is an example of uh, so quality like um, uh, fatty acid. Uh, concentrations and amounts in the soybean grown in the Northern America. If you look into on the left uh, figure A and B, it's uh, it's figure uh, uh, different fatty acids up or down in early maturing uh, genotypes, varieties that are uh, finishing filling seeds relatively early, early. C and D are the same uh, uh, relevant figures, but for the mid term maturing genotypes, and they experience different uh, amounts of different temperatures uh, during those uh, phases, uh, critically important for filling the seeds. And the figures E and F uh, are actually just um, uh, concentrations of the uh, linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. Alpha linoleic acid is one of the most abundant uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and as you can see, uh, it would be very relevant how uh, brittle your bone replacement would be because the amount of these uh, unsaturated bones is directly proportional to amount of uh, cross linkings that material can uh, form. Uh, however, when we use uh, when we produce these materials under uh, our controlled conditions of bioreactors, we can specifically uh, con and more narrowly control uh, conditions to produce specific uh, produce material of a specific fatty acid uh, profile. On the right here, you can see just uh, a few genotypes how they respond to different uh, cultivation uh, temperature, and in addition to uh, using just uh, cultivation uh, technique, we already relatively well understand metabolic uh, pathways to produce uh, fatty acids of different uh, uh, chain lengths or different uh, distribution uh, level. Uh, so far, we've been able to produce uh, uh, fatty acid with up to six unsaturated bonds, and uh, different strains have been already constructed that uh, stably produce uh, fatty acid with elevated uh, amounts of uh, double bonds in general, as, at least as it is at the moment, 
the more double bonds you have in your material, the higher uh, market price it is. Combining biotechnological approach, uh, the, combining um, recombinant DNA uh, technology and cultivation technology, uh, we are already able to meet specifications of significant industrial uh, requirements. Uh, in the context of specifically for this project uh, of oil-based uh, uh, binders, I would like here just to show a few uh, pictures. Here on the on the left, you can see dried biomass. The biomass, as it is, uh, it's completely suitable uh, even for human consumption, for food, feed. And on the, the right, you can see isolated uh, lipids, uh, this uh, blood red uh, color. It comes from uh, carotenoids, beta-carotene as one of the, the main, but also some additional. And we uh, were contemplating at the beginning of this uh, project. We were not really sure. Um, I mean, for the binders, for the, for the paints and things like that, uh, neutral colors are much better. These uh, highly intensive uh, uh, starting material would probably not be suitable for uh, white, paints or paints of uh, light colors. Uh, to address that relatively early in the project, we used uh, CRISPR-Cas as one of the tools to uh, cause uh, the sequence disruption. We targeted it, uh, the nucleases to carotenoid, bind, uh, carotenoid uh, biosynthetic uh, pathway to produce these white phenotypes. They are able to produce uh, same uh, oils uh, of same uh, uh, profile. However, they are not able to produce carotenoids, meaning that they, the uh, oils could be potentially used as binder in much wider palette of colors and, and uh, as such. However, uh, a lucky uh, thing is that it seems like the double bonds in fatty acid uh, during the oxidation period are actually also being epoxidized and which leads to destruction uh, of the pigment uh, site. Here, if you see on uh, this right top uh, picture, the right uh, uh, vial is our uh, crude uh, biological oil. And when it's epoxidized, there is loss of the color. Or on the bottom, you can see the binder already uh, produced where there's uh, full polymerization with uh, strong uh, discoloration, loss of the pigment, uh, uh, starting pigment. In addition to simply producing uh, uh, these biological oils, we are also working on the way how they are being produced. Uh, this uh, picture on the left side, you can see uh, cells yeast with a green uh, lipid body inside, but like any plant uh, oils, fats, uh, it's, uh, it, to reach them, uh, it requires for cells to be disrupted and oils extracted, which all leads to certain technological uh, kind of uh, challenges. Uh, the, this engineered strain was engineered in such a way that cells are acting as uh, more or less uh, biocatalysts. They produce fatty acid and then they secrete them in the environment. If you look here, the staining of the hydrophobic uh, things is actually completely outside and these secreted uh, fatty acids are forming uh, suspension. If you uh, try to um, spin your culture, the cell's gonna be collected on the bottom and the supernatant is uh, uh, forming stable suspension. It's much easier to extract the uh, fatty acid from the suspension. Uh, this is also the same thing, just uh, repeated uh, to show you that it performs uh, these uh, larger lumps that are much, much easier for separation and production procedure is significantly eased. In addition uh, to uh, playing with, uh, let's say, in the, pre in the case of the previous uh, yeast where we were looking to remove uh, color, now, in the case of Yarovia Lipolitik, <laughs> the ICL group actually went uh, the other way around. The wild type uh, Yarovia is completely uh, white, and uh, by going through a few, uh, few iterations of improvement, they ended up with a highly productive strain uh, that produces uh, beta-carotene, the same precursor of uh, vitamin A. Uh, 
uh, they optimize different expression uh, expression uh, cassettes and also the copy number to to produce uh, to my understanding one of the highest productive uh, organisms uh, of any species uh, however uh, the the pigment range that we are able to produce at least in uh, these two uh, labs uh, um, is not limited only to carotenoid pathway. Uh, there is additional one that uh, we wo we work. It's a wildlife scene. The metabolic pathway is relatively well understood. It's a uh, five uh, enzymes uh, production pathway that can be cloned, optimized, uh, combined with different promoters, terminators to produce material of different uh, colors. Uh, in addition to those, uh, we are uh, in early stages of even more intense uh, uh, pigments, but uh, we kind of uh, have just limited uh, success with those. However, they are very uh, promising, those extra uh, pigments. And with uh, that, more or less, I would like to conclude uh, the the group, this work was again, as I'm repeating, done by two, two separate group, but we have quite overlapping uh, interest and also different uh, projects that we work. And of course, these kind of inter, uh, um, multidisciplinary projects require uh, uh, expertise from different fields. And I would like to thank to all of the partners from this project. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. You know at the end of the presentation. Thank you. And the last speaker is Anders Ordo. Anders did his, his Master of Science at the Danish Technical University and he holds a PhD from Nobel Prize winner Morten Meldel Lab and is co-founder and CTO of Chromologics. Yes, thank you. Sajan, can you exit your presentation? Okay, there we go. Then I will share. All right. Thank you. My name is Anna Zudam. I'm from Promologics, and uh, my talk is a little bit on scale up of uh, precision fermentation of bio based ingredients. So it's following after what Sajan already just introduced. You do the strain engineering, but of course, you need to produce this um, in all the slides here. Uh, firstly, I want to quickly introduce uh, Chromologics. We are a spin out from the Technical University of Denmark. We have a production platform where we would like to produce colors. And the main pigment we've been working on for the last many years is a red pigment, as you can see in the bioreactor. And uh, I think one of our um, unique selling points is actually using bioreactors uh, to produce colors. This is grow growing in interest. There's a lot of people who follow this idea, but when we started in 2016 uh, with the company, this was something quite new. Um, and of course, there's some, some obvious benefits. Um, we started the company with the outlook of uh, replacing food colorants uh, because there it's a lot of uh, resources from farmland that's being used where the bioreactor just has the flexibility, has the supply reliability and price stability, which can be very uh, huge compared to if you think about crops and agriculture. Um, but of course, uh, for Perfect Coat, when we joined this, uh, the idea was also to expand and into different uh, industries because uh, color is everywhere. It's it's more important than people think. Um, so this is why we, of course, joined to, to help in this. A quick um, overview of what I would call the precision fermentation of bio ingredients is, is you start off with the strain engineering as Sajan just uh, kind of went through. Um, you can do a lot of work that you can spend many years developing strains, but of course you always have a target molecule. And, and in our case, we have a filamentous fungi. Um, so where Sajin was talking about yeast and, and Emily was talking about uh, bacteria, this is a filamentous fungi. We do strain engineering ourselves too, but in this project, we've worked mostly on the, the formula fermentation and harvest 
of actual the products, which all include a lot of uh, knowledge and equipment, but you do end up with this very nice red pigment uh, ready to use. One of the, the great ideas, uh, great reasons of using bioreactors is because they are kind of multifunctional. Um, a lot of different organisms have been tested in bioreactors. Bioreactors have been used for, I mean, hundreds of years to, to brew beer, but also in the last 50 years to brew medicines and enzymes and you name it. It's, it's something quite well known, quite established. And that's why this surge in precision fermentation in the last five years has really caught on because a lot of these different wild type strains that, that also Sajin mentioned, have interesting properties one way or the other. It's all about utilizing it and getting it out. But it does require a certain level of, of process understanding. And this is both pH, uh, media, temperature, and how to feed and everything. But as Sedin also mentioned, one of the main benefits is the, the sustainability profile because we can in these bioreactor systems utilize waste streams, both as on a water side, but on a feed side, on a carbon side. But also, of course, the main input is energy. And that's the further we get in, in, in this green transition, of course, you can use green energy. Um, and it's scalable, right? Unlike farmland, which is kind of what it is, bioreactors, they can scale um, hugely. I mean, the, the biggest ones are, you know, almost 400, 500,000 liters at a time. So it, it allows for great, great, uh, yields. Um, and I think a very unknown or unrecognized fact is bioreactors have quite high levels of quality control. So you can actually uh, remove contaminations or you can remove unwanted products. And in this way, you get something that's really of high quality. If we look at scaling and if we look at this uh, from from start to finish, right? As Sajin was also showing, he was some engineering part, uh, the cell engineering part. But then you walk in, when you have a strain that produces a pigment or a, uh, whatever you want to produce, you can, you, you go into the lab and you do this uh, screening in the media design. You typically do this in small scale. This is a shake flask, uh, maybe half a liter to a liter, maybe some bench top uh, bioreactors, two liters, five liters, 10 liters. But a lot of back and forth between these two sizes to find the right media, to find the right process, because fungi and bacteria and yeast, they're all sometimes a little bit of divas. They can be, they require a certain amount of love to, to grow and prosper to actually produce uh, the target molecule. But when you kind of hit that uh, sweet spot, maybe in the five or 10 liter, you want to move on to the pilot. Uh, you go up into these big skid systems, uh, maybe a thousand liter, and all the way up to production, which can go from fifteen thousand, but all the way up to a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand liters, depending on you know the product, the process, and everything in between. And this is a very uh, back and forth um, kind of system. You really need to test for a lot of things. Every scale up has its own issues. It can be oxygen. It can be foaming, it can be, yeah, a lot of things. Um, in our case, Chromologics, what we've been working on for the last many years is our red pigment, a proprietary color. Uh, and we follow the same trend. We start off in a shake flask. Here it looks almost black because it's, I mean, it's not a lot, but when it's color is additive, so it looks almost black. You can see in the, in the one liter here, we have a, a nice red color. Uh, this picture is maybe unfortunate because there's a lot of foaming, but that is one of the realities of um, growing microorganisms. And in our in-house uh, production that we just installed the 600 liters where we kind of uh, produce samples for customer testing. And I wanted to kind of show you a, uh, a skid of how a fermentation with both upstream and downstream looks like in, in our case, we are using a filamentous fungi. So that takes approximately five to seven days, depending on how you count, but maybe five days in the bioreactor. But to be able to make your product, you have to look at the other things. As Sajin also mentioned, the, the harvest, sometimes you want it intracellular, sometimes you have something as extracellular. So you need some biomass removal, you need some purification steps. 
is typically a recovery step. And finally, for, for a lot of ingredients, there is a drying step. Um, and one of the principles that at least we from Logics have tried to, to build is we want a continuous process. So we want to minimize downtime. So that is why the, bio, the downstream is approximately four to five days, which matches up, aligns up with the fermentation. Which, so, so quickly a fermentation can go into a downstream. Um, one thing that we have to unfortunately do is we have to decouple at the drying step. Drying, typically spray drying or freeze drying or other types of drying, very energy intensive. So this is something you wanna have full utilization of the capacity before you start these. But it is try. But our general concept is to try to have uh, a an overlap, so we have a continuous and no downtime of the equipment, because that is what is expensive in the kind of final production phase. I, I want to take a short uh, story of Kubelogics. Uh, not all of it, just our scaling side. Uh, our journey starts in 2013, where Garrett, our my co-founder, she started her PhD and it wasn't the first time in possession of the strain that made the color. In 2016, we discovered the, the molecules, the atrocent, we purified them, we made the patents. And that was also where we combined, had a, a moment of uh, entrepreneurial spirit and actually started Chromologics. It wasn't until almost two and a half years later before we scaled it from these half liter, one liter to 50 liter which back then was huge. Uh, if you think of it now, it's maybe a fourth of your fridge. So it's actually not so big, but you know, in our heads, it was very, very big. In 21, we joined Perfect Code and shortly after actually scaled it to 1,500 liters. And we quickly followed up with 15,000 liters and produced almost hundred kilos. And now uh, this year we actually uh, signed a manufacturing agreement to go up into the hundred to 200,000 liter scale, uh, which of course is where we also begin to reap the benefits of scale. Uh, the amounts and products we come out per is just humongous. It's fantastic. It's really cool. And kind of with that, I would like to show you some of the, uh, a picture from our last press release of our red pigment. Um, so this was taken in relation with our fundraising last year. And I think it's, I don't know, I just really, I've been working with the color for seven years. I really love it. It's just beautiful. And, and with that, I would like to, of course, say uh, also thank you to our Chronologics team. And as I said, the goal to begin with was pioneering natural food colors. But uh, we are, of course, very now much interested in pioneering colors in general and uh, we'll probably rebrand to color crafters within the next couple of months. If you're interested in samples, re please reach out to me either over Chromologics or LinkedIn, and then uh, I can get you in contact with Lisbeth, who is our head of business development. And as the final slide, I promise to do some advertisement. Our next webinar is uh, 13th of May. It's about uh, formulation and testing. It is the reality check of all these new greener ingredients um, in the actual paints and coatings performed by other partners of this consortium. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all three speakers. We will now come to the Q&A section. And there are a few questions. So let's start with the question from Lina. What is the difference between binder and resin? I think it was during Amelie's uh, presentation. It really depends on whom you ask. A lot of people use it synonymously. And for our intents and purposes, we use it synonymously. So it depends on also the binder systems that you use. From my best understanding, it is um, that the resin also often contains a mixture of different binders that when it hardens, it forms the resin. But depending on which literature you read, resin and binder are used interchangeably. Okay, thank you. And another question for you, Amelie. How does this process compare to traditional uh, filler production methods in terms 
of environmental impact and performance? Is it economically feasible? So I think that's going to be part of one of our next few um, webinar series where we talk about sustainability and the environmental impact. What I can say is that traditionally filler molecules have been really, really cheap. Um, and often they're just mined calcium carbonate, which is basically chalk, right? So um, the energy input there comes from either precipitating it out of water or grinding it up, mining it and grinding it up. Compared to that, it really depends on the process and the scale that it used on, is used on any other filler production. So it's really hard right now to make an assessment given that A, the industrial processes aren't there yet for the microbial fillers. And as Anders said, there are scaling effects depending on which size you go in, which will allow you to have a better footprint uh, at larger scales. Okay, thanks. And there is a question for Siadan. Could you list the more the most promising extraction techniques and feedstocks options up to now? Um, so regarding the extraction uh, here under the in lab conditions, we like the most uh, solid extraction. It can be done relatively um, under mild conditions and it extracts full uh, spectra of uh, fatty acid. However, uh, we've been also working with uh, heat extraction that seem to generate certain uh, uh, byproducts as a consequence of uh, of elevated uh, reactivity at, uh, at elevated temperatures. Uh, depends on the uh, application, what uh, it's going to be used for. It might be a problem or not. Uh, we are, with our partners, we are testing all of them. Uh, regarding feedstocks options, uh, the strains that we work with, actually the species, we work with uh, a range of uh, which I presented only two. Uh, we've been using many from um, uh, slaughterhouse waste, uh, dairy um, uh, waste stream, uh, hydrolyzed food, uh, hydrolyzed uh, straw. Uh, the strain can consume all of those. Uh, what I would uh, specifically like to mention, this strain that we work with, uh, actually species, uh, uh, rhodotoral toroloides with many strains, uh, many of industrially uh, generated uh, inhibitors and toxins uh, during uh, lignocellulosic material. Uh, hydrolysis are toxic for E. coli, saccharomyces, and other microbes. However, our species actually consumes them further down to mineralize the uh, basic uh, substances and biomass. So that's kind of, um, I would say, uh, whoever is planning, consider what's locally available and test them because this species has a very, very wide range of substrates that it can consume. Yeah, thanks. And for both of you, are there specific pigments uh, that are especially hard for, to generate in a bio-based version? Amiri, you want to go first? I think when it comes to pigments, that's Anders. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. I mean, there's hundreds of pigments. Um, so there's not any specific. I mean, the bio-based pigments, all the, all the synthetic pigments, the azo dyes are, of course, more or less impossible to produce by bio. Um, but all the pigments you see outside, they can be done some way or another in the filamentous fungi or yeast or bacteria. But the very chemically ones are, yeah, very difficult. Okay. I Sorry, I'm going to just uh, say that uh... Um, more and more we are able to design enzymes to do completely unnatural chemical reactions and uh, the main challenge here is actually toxicity of the final products and by and uh, intermediates if there is no significant toxicity of any of those uh, we are uh, more and more able to produce quite random uh, chemical substances including pigments Okay, the next question is, could these pig pigments also be used in alternative applications such as 
food coloring, textiles, or print ink? Uh, yes, I think that's one uh, one of the many uses. I mean, of course, the colors, uh, for, as Satin also said, for food, they need to be safe. Uh, for textiles, it's typically a stability thing. Uh, mm -hmm. For print ink, I'm not so sure what they need to be done, but uh, it's the same. Right? The, the, the big hurdle of a lot of colors is the stability, long-term stability. We have, uh, within our collaborations, uh, we are mostly focusing in uh, natural uh, pigments, and they are intensive, already intensively used uh, as additives to food, either as uh, simply for the color, or for conservation as antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to plasticize the AA AESO to make it more flexible, for example, with the eject ESBO? Uh, I am not uh, sure about the second part because I'm not a chemist. However, as part of the collaboration, the, the groups that we work with generated a range of material from a very rigid and brittle to rubbery-like uh, materials. Uh, as um, as a co-binder, uh, it also can, it significantly depends on other component of uh, reactive mixture, uh, what's final physical property of material that you are targeting. Thank you. And Siajan, are your solutions facing the food versus feed controversy, uh, controversy or are you using only residues anyway? Um, Yes and no. So our species are completely um, able to grow on those uh, classical uh, uh, glucose and substrates and things like that. However, we are developing mostly technologies not uh, conflicting with those ethical uh, issues. Uh, we grow them. The most significant uh, substrate for us is uh, agriculture, um, forestry, uh, based and byproduct. Uh, or those uh, municipal waste and things like that, that uh, removal by itself is actually improvement to current practices. And for Amelie, what are toxic substances being screened? And for uh, first for, for Amelie, the question. What are the toxic substances being, being screened? So there's a variety of them. Um, I focus personally on volatile organic carbons. So those are usually the, the classic offenders are formaldehyde, halogenated uh, compounds, benzyl containing compounds, so the BTEX. Uh, and we have tested the coding on a variety of different ones uh, and are currently still expanding that portfolio. Mm -hmm. And for Siadan, is the fatty acid production scaled up? Uh, yes, there are already production facilities. At the moment, uh, microbial uh, oils have a higher price than uh, classical uh, conventional plant-derived oils. However, depending on application due to their more uh, narrowly defined uh, fatty acid profile, they do uh, have certain already commercial application for us here we do not yet have a commercial scale however the the company that is that i mentioned during uh, presentation is uh, pre-commercial and already uh, applying for different approvals once those approval are available um, acquired uh, they are planning to go into commercial scale production And at Anders, did you test color fastness of the red pigment? Uh, uh, yes, in, dif in different uh, matrices. Uh, UV resistance, I cannot recall. But on textiles, for example, the color resistance is, I can't remember the exact, it's half, half. I think two is, so it's, it's not super color resistant in textiles. I don't know what you're referring to, in what type of product. Mm -hmm. um, and at Amelie, 
how stable are these coatings containing microorganisms at functionalizing components? Is it possible to ensure stability over years? So I think it's very similar to what Anders just said. It depends very much on what level of stability we're also talking about. Are we talking about film integrity or are we talking about catalytic activity or sensing abilities? So we have tested these coatings for several months now and we see remaining catalytic activity, we see stability. Um, I have yet to really find a coating that disintegrates or like falls apart. Um, but these tests are still undergoing and um, without really knowing in which direction the question goes, it's really hard to comment on it. And the last one from the Q&A uh, at Anders, what is the advantage of the red color you are producing compared to the current ones regarding sustainability, safety and price? Uh, I think it, it again depends on what industry, but if we're thinking our main ones, which is food, it's clear the sustainability is we can uh, we can scale it, we can produce it year round and have a price compared stable price compared to, for example, carbonic acid, which is extracted from lice and is very volatile in price. Um, on the safety part, we are undergoing all our safety tests, and there is no problems. Okay, thank you. And I think there is one more question in the chat. Let me just check. Um, at Amelie, how stable are, oh no, I think we had this. No, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Mm. I have another one. Um, have there been any LCA conducted on any of the development uh, developed solutions and are they already more sustainable in comparison to their fossil based alternatives? I think this is again part of one of the next talks where we talk about sustainability, life cycle assessments and cost comparisons. Okay. Then I think we covered all the questions. Thank you very much. Um, to all speakers, thank you again. And thank you to the participants for your questions and comments. And um, you will find the slides and the recording soon on the project page. And please remember to sign up for, this, uh, for the upcoming uh, webinar series. Next is on May 13th. Okay, then we can close up here. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.